Well, we're working through the divisions of theology here over the years, and um, some people said, can we possibly fill a whole semester on angels? And uh, now that it's week 10 of 12, I'm feeling pressure that we're running out of time. How can we even get it all in? But uh, you've been great and hanging in there with us through some uh, interesting things that take a little bit of uh, a mind stretcher to understand this class of beings outside of the physical, temporal realities of what we're used to every day. And as we've switched over to the, to the dark side here, studying Satan and demons, um, I trust it's been something that you've done in accordance with what I exhorted you as your pastor to do, and that is don't let this dominate your thinking, but yet God would not have us be ignorant of this. So don't take it too far. We're not going to try to de- find a demon under every rock but we would be foolish to go through life without ingesting the data that God gave us in His Word about this arena, this part of reality that will become very clear on the day that you die. So uh, we're going to get a great lesson in a lot of aspects of theology. But before we dive into week number 10, why don't you bow with me? Hopefully you've got your worksheet ready to go, and we will uh, we'll dive into it. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for what you have helped us to learn here this last uh, semester. We've thought through things and hopefully dispelled some myths about the uh, fat, chubby cherub on a Christmas ornament or uh, the depictions that are so frequently uh, shoved in our face by our culture. We've started to think more biblically and accurately about these creatures that are uh, awesome in power and they're uh, majestic and 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 intelligent and, and, and amazing, all that we've learned about the angelic class. And then we have a great sense of respect, hopefully like uh, Michael the archangel, not uh, uh, willing to uh, be able to, to re- revile against things that we don't uh, really even have the right to, these powerful demons that have fallen and have rebelled against your will. Uh, we don't want to uh, fear them in the sense that they have any kind of ultimate uh, effect on our lives, but we do uh, live with that kind of, of concern that you call us to, remembering that we have a, an enemy that's powerful, shrewd, and wise, and uh, he and his henchmen, they roam about uh, seeking someone to devour. So we want to be uh, vigilant. We want to be careful. We don't want to be ignorant of the schemes of the enemy, as Paul said. So continue to build our knowledge as we wrap up this uh, semester here in the next few weeks, Lord willing. Thanks for this team, this crowd. I know that many are uh, because of the busyness of this season having to to go elsewhere on these last few weeks. But thanks for those that were able to come tonight. Give us a great study together. May it be edifying and helpful in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Well, we've already looked at Satan's agenda, and tonight I want to look at the average demon's agenda and do what we can with the data that we have in the Scripture Uh, And first of all, what I'd like you to do is to turn back to Job chapter 1 as we think about the demons and what they are all about, what they're here to do. Uh, We've talked a lot about what Satan's agenda is. Let's talk about demons, and particularly this first section, not very difficult for us. Just some simple observations and we can move on. Now, we've looked at this a couple of times in our series, but look at verse number 6 again. Verses 6 through 8 is all we're going to take a look at. But it says, now there was a day, this is Job 1, 6, when the sons of God, the Ben Elohim, we've had to deal with that phrase a lot throughout this series, uh, recognizing that's a a very uh, uh, telling phrase that helps us to understand how God gives nomenclature and titles to these beings. But it says, when the sons of God, the Ben Elohim, came to present themselves before the Lord, which is an interesting concept. I know there's board meetings of some kind going on. Uh, And Satan, the opposer here, he also came among them. And the Lord said to Satan, from where have you come? And Satan answered the Lord and said, don't you know I'm omniscient and omnipresent? I've been everywhere. Uh, That's not what he says. Uh, it's kind of chilling to, to recognize that Satan is somewhere, right? He's, he says, well, I've come back from going to and fro on the earth. That's where I've been. And walking up and down on it. Does that make you pause? Read that slowly. And Wow, he's somewhere. 
uh, doing something. He may not be on earth right now today, but he is somewhere. And the Lord said, uh, as Job gulps later, recognizing he's the target of the the bragging of God, have you considered my servant Job? And then you know the rest of the story, and on it goes. Number one, or letter A, just put this down just to remind ourselves that Satan is finite and he is limited. He has to be somewhere at any given time. Because he is not physical, we're not talking about a body, but we're talking about spirits apparently in the creation and the interaction between spirit and, 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 and the corporal realities of, 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 of life, flesh and bone and brick and mortar. Uh, he has to have a focalized presence. He's not like God, see? So we talk about God and his agenda. I mean, that's a different kind of discussion than Satan and his agenda. We recognize that Job uh, re- reveals to us that he is he's finite. He's got an agenda. We looked at that at length for an hour and a half, but that cannot be carried out personally. So, of course, you don't need to look this one up. We've looked at it several times. There's several passages that tell us this, at least three. But Matthew 25, 41, you might remember, it refers to Satan and it says his angels. The devil and his angels, or even as Matthew 9, 34 says, that Satan is the prince of the demons. So therefore, and you've heard me use this phrase throughout, I like to call them henchmen. I'm not trying to be, uh, you know, uh, flippant about it. I just think that's a good word to describe what they do. They are loyal. I mean, if you want to be disrespectful, you call them goons, I guess, right? Uh, they, 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 they are thugs. There I'm being disrespectful. Uh, they are, they are uh, emissaries of their leader. They have a leader. I'm not sure why they stick with their leader, but apparently they do. Henchman is a decent word. In Old English, the word hench uh, meant horse, and a horse was bridled to do the bidding of the one who rides it or the one who attaches it to the, to the, to the coach or to the, the chariot, and the horse just does the bidding of the one in charge, the henchman. And usually it's taken on a negative connotation in our language, and so that's what they are. They're bridled in some way, don't know how or why, to the bidding and the will of Satan. And we've looked at his agenda for an hour and a half, looking at what the Bible says his agenda is, and that's been clear throughout the Scripture. So we go back, and I printed it so we didn't have to rewrite it all, but the essence of what we dealt with for that uh, session on, on message, if you keep track of these things and want to listen to it again, or you missed that week, 1162, uh, you can download all those for free, as you know. Focal Point commercial, do we need one right now? All the Focal Point messages are free anytime for you to download but they're not free because nothing's free, right? It's by the faithful support of you donors that make Focal Point go. And have I made clear that it is not a ministry of Compass Bible Church? It's a separate ministry. So when you give to Compass Bible Church, not a dime of that goes to Focal Point. This feels like an unnecessary commercial for Focal Point, but it may be helpful for two or three of you here if ever at Christmas time you feel like, I want the Word of God to go out through Focal Point on XM Radio. Have I told you we're on XM Radio now? One thirty-one at 5 o'clock on the East Coast. It's a great time, drive time. Uh, so you may want to uh, think about that as you get generous in December. And have I told you that I don't take any money or salary or anything from Focal Point? <laughs> just to make you feel better about that. It's not going to my blue Porsche fund or anything like that. It is a complete lean and mean volunteer-led ministry with the exception of one employee, Jay Wharton, who does a great job directing that ministry. So if you want an hour and a half on it, you got it. But here's the sub points, and I thought I'd give you something to fill in. But in terms of what we dealt with, I kind of reworded the main sections of that lecture. But God uh, has told us in the Word that Satan is out to oppose the church. And we talked about how he wants to persecute the church, how he wants to keep the church from assembling and the people in the church from getting together. He wants to promote conflict. He wants to oppose our evangelism. He wants to get people to leave and bail out of the church, right? He's also interested in messing up your home. He doesn't want your home to function properly. We looked at verses. These are just a few samplings of the verses we looked at in in terms of usurping dad's leadership in the home, promoting adultery and infidelity in marriage, inciting rebellion and, and particularly, we think of our children and how God would want our children to be obedient. That's so important in the Scripture. And to promote civil, sibling, ri- sibling rivalry. And uh, certainly that started early uh, after the inversion of the roles in marriage in Genesis 3. We had uh, brothers killing each other 
in Genesis 4, which 1 John 3 talks about. Then also, He wants to corrupt your life. He'd like to get you to turn on God. He'd like you to be mad at God. He'd like you to shake your fist at God. That's His agenda. To rely on your own resources, to make you anxious and worried, to impede your sanctification. That's all we had time for that night, but that might be worth having there. And and I reprinted it so that when you think through what the demon's agenda is, you need to know they're bridled horses, henchmen, doing the bidding of their master, in this case, the prince of demons, and this was his agenda. Therefore, hermeneutically, when you read the Bible and you get to a passage like, uh, I don't know, he blinds the minds of the unbelieving, 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4. You, you, see, you see the text say Satan is blinding the minds of the unbelievers, but I've already told you he's a finite, limited being. How many people can he work on at one time? And here's the deal. He's probably not working on anybody individually right now, unless, I don't know, there's some big target that he's after. His henchmen carry out that assignment. When it says he's roaming around like a lion seeking someone to devour, well, I guess we got examples of Job, and he's personally taking note of Job when God brings him up in the the boardroom. But really, I mean, he's got his henchmen out there doing that, seeking to devour people. If, If Satan himself is doing all of this by himself, not a lot of it's getting done because he's a finite, limited being. So when you read the Bible... I know the Bible is saying Satan does these things, and of course he participates. We have examples of that. But we need to read those recognizing he has workers to do that. He's not like God. Even though God doesn't need to, he sometimes delegates his his jobs to to, to angelic beings, and we looked at that. We do need to remember that when it comes to Satan, it's a whole different ballgame. He has to, or not much gets done here on earth to advance his cause. So the underlings, the minions, there's one. What was that movie that used that word? That kid's movie? What was it? Despicable Me. Me. The minions. Maybe that's what we should call them. The minions. All right. Yeah, it's like I, I just thought about, you know, we talk about Osama bin Laden when he was alive. Uh, you know, doing this or that. And I'm thinking he's not doing anything, right? He's watching porn on his laptop in Pakistan, right? I'm sorry if you didn't know that. <laughs> you got no response from you. But, uh, <laughs> you know, he's sending his, his thumb drives off to go have things done. He's the, you know, he's the boss man. His, his, his henchmen are doing the work. Uh, and, and that's how it is with Satan. I don't know. Bin Laden's been compared to Satan many times. I just thought I'd jump on the bandwagon. All right. Simple section. Did you, did you digest? That was easy, wasn't it? Nothing, nothing crazy there. Easy to understand. Let's talk about this, though. It'll get crazier before the night is over. Demonic work to oppose people. And that's all I got room for on the screen in terms of the title. But you see what I put down as the first word on your worksheet. Instances of this. Okay? These are instances of this. These are just examples in the Bible. Okay? And that's important. We'll come back to that. But let's build a bit of a, an outline and some subpoints here. Clearly, we're going to get into several things. If we look at demons' work in the Bible, what are they doing to carry out Satan's agenda? We get much more specific about how he's doing some of that. How does he oppose mankind? Uh, well, he does that, certainly, the Bible says, through physical problems in people's lives. Take your Bibles and turn to Matthew 9, and let's look at a few examples from the Gospels to build some subpoints here. Six of them, I think I listed, six of them. As we think through um, what we have in the Bible regarding the demonic work in people's lives or on people's lives or against people's lives and clearly attributing these things to demonic involvement. See the title in the ESV when you get to verse 32 there? The editors have put in a little title there. It says, Jesus heals a man unable to speak. Well, that's just half the story. Verse 32. As they were going away, behold, a, and what did I say the word was? We already dealt with this. Demonizomai, right? The demonizomai, the demon-caused passivity. Something in the person is not functioning as it ought because of a demon. Demon, it's the noun, right, is this stem that shows a, a causal relationship um, and, and passivity, the ending of that, oh my. The, the demon caused passivity, more on that next week, uh, it says, who was mute, was brought to Jesus. And when the demon had been cast out, oh, there was a, a correlation. The mute man spoke, and the crowd marveled, saying, never has anything like this been seen in Israel. 
But the Pharisees said, well, he cast out demons by the, here's the passage I just quoted, the prince of demons. Okay, put this down. At least I'm just going through examples in the Bible. Here is a passage in the Holy Scriptures that says there is a man who can't speak, and the reason is there's a demon. The demon caused muteness in this guy's life, and when the demon was gone, the man was able to speak. Let's keep going. Let's go to Mark chapter 9. We'll be back to Matthew here in a second. Mark chapter 9. Let's just jump into the middle of this narrative because we're going to look at the parallel passage a little bit later. So we don't need to get this whole context or, or scene. But let's just jump into verse 25. Mark chapter 9, verse 25. When Jesus saw that a crowd came running together, he rebuked the unclean spirit. We've already seen, as we looked last time, at the names of demons in the Bible. This is one of the words for them. The spirit, he's a spirit, he's, he's, he's unclean, he's, he's evil. So we're talking about a demon here. And he's saying to it, you mute and deaf spirit. You can jot that down, right? I command you, come out of him and never enter this man again. And after crying out and convulsing terribly, he came out and the boy was like a corpse. They thought he was dead, but Jesus took him by the hand, lifted him up and rose him up. And as the rest of the scripture says, in harmony, we see this kid now is is well. He's well. He's well not only in that he can speak, he's well in that he can hear. And Jesus even says to the spirit, who of course is not deaf, you're a deaf spirit. You can see now why when you think about the, you know, certain aspects or, or categories of the church, the modern church is obsessed with demons. They start naming demons and their effect. Well, I mean, that's not new to the Pentecostals or anybody. This is, this is what we, we do find here. Jesus himself calling it a mute and deaf spirit that causes muteness and deafness in this guy. And Jesus heals him by means of casting a demon out. Matthew 12. I told you we'd be back to Matthew. Matthew chapter 12. Look at verse 22. Matthew 12, 22. Here's our word again. Demonizomai, the, the demon caused passive man, and some, there was something about this guy that was passive, and it was caused by a demon. Then a demon possessed or oppressed man. Remember what I told you about that that was interesting? What did I tell you about the translation of demonizomai in the New Testament? Half the time it's translated demon possessed, and half the time it's translated demon oppressed. And wasn't it translated the other way in Matthew 9? Demon, oh no, demon oppressed. I may have read it. Demon possessed, but demon oppressed. Half the time. Nine references of this, I think I said. Five and four. A demon oppressed man who was blind and mute. There's our third one. He was blind and mute, was brought to him, and he healed him so that the man spoke and saw. And all the people who were amazed, they said, can this be the son of David? They knew there was something about the coming Messiah that was going to be authenticated by him doing miraculous signs. And wow, they, they put two and two together. But when the Pharisees heard of it, they're always down in this, right? He says, it's only by Beelzebub. That, that the prince of demons, that he cast out demons. Well, we already saw in Matthew 9, he, they said that earlier. So this was kind of their standard response when they saw Jesus doing something to release a man from the damage of a demon in his physical life. So far, I've got muteness, deafness, and blindness. Let's turn to Luke 13. Luke chapter 13. And I know what you're thinking. I've heard people talk about this. Well, this was just the ancients' way of describing illnesses that they didn't understand, right? Um, it's, not, it's not what the Bible teaches, right? The Bible makes it very clear that there is a demonic reason in these instances for muteness, deafness, and blindness, right? Because the real interesting thing about the person that diagnosed the problem is that he could fix the problem. That gives him some credibility, seeing that the doctors can't, right? So stick with the diagnosis of the one who has the power to fix the problem. Luke 13, you're there, verse 10. Now he was teaching, that is Christ, in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath. 
And behold, there was a woman who had a disabling spirit. Is that not what the ESV title says on this paragraph? Disabling spirit. For 18 years, she was bent over and could not fully straighten herself. So this is a physical problem. Her body's bent, can't straighten up. When Jesus saw her, he called her over and he said, Woman, you are freed from your disability. He laid his hands on her, and immediately she was made straight and glorified God. And then in verse 14, they start complaining that, you know, he did it on the wrong day. And Jesus defends himself. I'll put it this way, deformities. And again, you can argue about what the cause of it is. Well, the intermediate cause could be who knows what. Right? Is this scoliosis? Is this, I don't know, chronic back pain? Is this a slip disc? It, what, what is wrong with this lady? You can explain it in terms of, of biology, but God is giving us the ultimate cause of this, which is a demon. Right? Still going here. Six. We'll, we'll make some conclusions here in a minute. I'm um, five. I'm sorry. Five is important. Matthew 17. Let's turn there. Matthew chapter 17. This is probably the most frequently connected in people's minds of the kind of physical problem that a demon would cause. But I've already showed you that there's a wide variety of problems. Verse 14. Are you there? When they came to the crowd, a man came up to him, that is Christ, kneeling before him and said, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is an epileptic, and he suffers terribly, for he often falls into the fire and often into the water. And I brought him to your disciples, and they could not heal him. And Jesus answered, O faithless and twisted generation, how long am I to be with you? How long am I to bear with you? Bring him to me. And Jesus rebuked the demon. And it came out of him, and the boy was instantly healed. The connection between his problem of an epileptic, which is someone who has seizures, and we can look at other passages. These aren't the only examples, which it describes more fully foaming at the mouth and rolling on the floor. Those kinds of physical symptoms, in this case, are diagnosed by Christ as being caused by a demon. And if the demon can be addressed, which in this case is to cast him out or rebuke him in verse 18, just rebuke him is what it says here, and leave him, then the boy is instantly healed and no longer has seizures. Now, for the passages that I find in the, in the Gospels, these are the the four, five things that I see. That's not all, though, that I can connect as I look back even to Job, if you want to use the prince of the demons. What does Job have as his problem? It's gross. I mean, he's, bo- he's got boils from head to toe that he's scraping the pus off of his skin with broken pottery, the pot sheards, as he, you know, I, I, oh, picture that. Don't picture that for very long. You just ate Chinese food, did you not? What did you eat? Doesn't matter. Don't think about what you ate. Don't think about Job. Just think about this. Think about the fact that that was caused by, right, Satan, demonic. I'll just give you one more just to give you the catch-all, all all sorts of illnesses. I'll give you 2 Corinthians uh, 12, 7 is just an example uh, which should open this up. And see, you can go one of two directions with this. When you start, well, let's read the text first. If you, if you want to turn there, that, that's great. You'll get an extra brownie point from me, which you can cash in never. There's no Bible buck store for adults. <laughs> Second Corinthians 12, you know the text, you know the story. Jesus, I'm sorry, Paul has been given this vision of stuff he doesn't tell us about. Thanks for bringing that up and then not telling us. Don't you hate that? People say, I got something amazing happening. Oh, I can't tell you. Well, that's what happened to us in this text. And to keep me from becoming conceited because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations... A thorn was given to me in the flesh. Now, look at how he defines this. A messenger of Satan 
which may even be able to be translated as another name which we didn't use because it's, it's debatable here because he's calling the thorn that. But really, who are the messengers of Satan? Demons are. So we've got, perhaps he's even trying to bring our mind to that. Demons have been sent to me, and it's giving me this thorn in the flesh to harass me, to keep me from becoming deceited, uh, conceited. And I pleaded three times, God, take it away, take it away, take it away. And he said, no, I'm not going to take it away. Therefore, he says, I'm, I'm going I'm I'm to be fine with it, which basically is a mini Job story right there, at least the beginning chapters of Job, right? He glorifies God. Okay, I'm going to be okay with this. So think this through now. You've got physical problems caused not only by the people who are roaming the, you know, the Palestinian uh, you know, sidewalks of, of ancient Jerusalem and, and Galilee. You've got, you've got Paul, an apostle, writing the New Testament who sees his physical ailment as connected with Satan or a messenger of Satan, to be specific. Now, think that through. I, I want to make this statement. Not all health problems are demon-caused. But you really ought to think that one through and not just gulp it down like, oh, I was hoping he was going to say that. Because what is it about sickness in the first place that makes us say, wow, this is, this is wrong? Cancer is a great example of this. Cancer, I mean, if you want to quote Bible verses in relation to cells, you can do it here. I mean, they are cells that do not keep their proper abode, Right? To, to, to speak of, of demons in, in 2 Peter and Jude. They are they're things that are transgressing their proper boundaries. They are doing damage to what is healthy in our bodies. Right? Almost everything is that way that we determine to be sickness. I mean, if you want to draw a parallel between sickness and demons, you can do it in theory at least. Right? And then we see examples of the connection. But I do want to say that not all health problems are demon-caused because there seems to be distinctions made, for instance, in another passage worth looking at here before we leave this topic, just to drive it home, Matthew chapter 4. Let's go to Matthew chapter 4 to show you an example where it seems like the biblical text is making distinctions between the demon-possessed people and the demon-caused problems to the problems that are not directly demon-caused. Although I think everyone could build a corollary in their mind if they thought it through long enough. You know what? All we see in sickness is a connection between what demons are all about, at least so far in this lecture, and what's happening in our bodies, right? I mean, even when you get a cavity, right? I mean, you can think about, that's not right. This is deterioration of what should be strong and should be good, should be healthy, and now it's being deteriorated by something that's corrupting it. That is what we, the words and the phrases we use to describe demons and what they are all about. Matthew 4, drop all the way down to verse 24. So his fame, that's Christ, spread throughout all Syria, right? It's the northern part above uh, uh, Israel, near the Decapolis up north. And they all brought him, they, they brought him the sick, comma, those afflicted with various diseases and pains, comma, those oppressed by demons, comma, epileptics, paralytics, and he healed them. There's passages like this, and there are others like it. You could do, I mean, some of the cross-references to this would be helpful in your study Bible. Seem to make distinctions between them. Though I can say it's right up their alley. Any sickness you have, I mean, that's what they're all about. I got to keep the distinctions that the Bible makes and at least say, hey, I can't attribute every sickness to demonic activity because of another principle. Your loss of health equals and is God keeping His promise. And you know what passage to put next to that, don't you? Go back to the beginning. What, with, when do we get God promising that you are going to crumble and turn into dirt? Genesis chapter 3, right? The curse of Genesis chapter 3 is because you are now sinful, and actually it's an act of grace that he guards the tree of life by the cherubim there in the, in the garden, he says, you know what, uh, I'm going to have you die so that you can be released from this distance, this, this death spiritually that we have. We can fix the problem, uh, and, and we're going to kill you off. So you're going to deteriorate and die. 
Uh, and that's hard. It's hard at any age. I was talking to a couple today that lost their young uh, 20-something son, and, and uh, you know, how, how do you just, well, hey, God's keeping His promise, right? Uh, that's hard to swallow. It's hard when they're 28. It's hard when they're 24. It's hard when they're 14. It's even hard when they're 94. That's what I don't like at funerals. And people say, well, you know, at least you lived a good long life. Well, I'd like to keep her around, you know. Would have been great had she been healthy and lived forever. That's the whole point. He's put eternity in our hearts. We want to live on. Do you see what I'm saying? So death is a problem no matter what. We don't like it. It's the enemy, according to 1 Corinthians 15, that needs to be destroyed by God. But He has appointed it. Therefore, when we get sick and die, or let's just say get sick, eventually we're going to die, the point is God's keeping His promise. So I know this. I'm not going to attribute every sickness to a demon because I know God has programmed in our bodies to die. So if nothing got involved, if every demon were caged right now, there would still be death, right? Because that was His intention for every human being. The other thing I think that is worth noting here, oh, I'm going to get to that in a minute. We'll get, we'll get to that after this second section here. Are you tracking with that? Now, those are two different things, and it's hard to kind of reconcile those, but demons want to make us sick and die. God has decided that we're all going to get sick and die. Jesus comes and reverses some of that, which I should get into this now, I guess. Not because He goes, oops, you're mute. Oh, my demon got a hold of you. Oh, I got I to reverse that. Come, oh, whoop, I'll fix that for you. Right? Here's the problem with the, every person that got healed, including Lazarus, who got the ultimate healing, did he not? That's a big day at the doctor's office. You go in dead and you come out alive. That's great. But here's the problem with Lazarus. What was the problem? Dies again, man. Bummer. He had to die twice. I mean, it was good that he was brought back from the dead, but he's going to die. God is not backed into a corner. Some people that always are trying to, every sickness needs to be healed. You know, the health and prosperity guys, part of the problem with that thinking is they think that's God's will always to heal. And I want to start with this. It may be at times God's will to heal, but it's always a temporary measure because it is God's will to kill us, right? Ultimately. Now, that's a harsh way to put it. How about this? God's plan is to program us to die. That's His plan. And as I like to point out, every health and wealth prosperity preacher dies, and usually because they're really sick, right? When they say, what, what did your uncle die of? Don't ever say nothing serious because it's always serious, right? <laughs> I mean, think that one through. <laughs> Nothing serious. No, everybody dies of a serious problem. That's why they die. So, you need to understand when it comes to this, God is not, we, we cannot play by the rules we see in the Gospels because here we have Christ reversing these things. Remember what the response to the reversal of the problem was. What? Son of David. That was the point. The prophecy was, you'll hear that the blind will see. And then what? Well, then you'll know Christ has arrived. And have I not taught you this? The GT1s of Scripture occur in three rashes. Did this not come up in this series and this, this semester? Less than 100 in three rashes, Joshua and Moses, Elijah and Elisha's period, and Jesus and the apostles. Those are three short periods in a long, epic, recorded history of the Bible. So it is not normative for us to expect God to reverse the problems. Now, what is the cause of the problems? Sometimes the cause of the problems are demonic, and sometimes it's the wiring of the dying bodies that He put us in. Because I could have added to the physical problems, which I didn't, you know, death, <laughs> right? That's what they would like to do. Though I'm not sure there's any clear Scripture on that. You could go to, I suppose, Revelation chapter 12, uh, Rev 10, you could maybe look at 1 Corinthians, is it 4, where he says, turn him over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. Clearly, Satan would like to kill us, and demons are all about killing us, but there's no, you know, there's no hooded, grim, demonic reaper with his reaping tool, city boy says. What's that? <laughs> yeah, that thing. It's the sickle. Thank you. Word I have not used lately. Sickle. Thank you. Letter B. 
demonic work to oppose people. So we got to package what we got there in our minds as best we can. Now let's talk about this, mental problems. Mental problems. I would have liked to have called this psychological problems, but because of the hijacking of the word psychological, I can't use that anymore. Uh, you know what? Um, suke is the, com- is the compound word here. Suke, logia, the, st- the study of is logia. We know that. Suke is the word for soul, right? The immaterial part of who we are. Satan is involved in sending his henchmen to oppose the physical part of who we are. But we are not hardware. We're software. We live in hardware, right? You don't have a spirit, as C.S. Lewis says. You are a spirit that lives in a body. That spirit now is going to be opposed. And the opposition of demons to the spirit in the Bible, the extreme examples that we see of it, are I'll give you three. Is that what I've given you? Luke 8. Let's start there. Luke chapter 8. I think you would agree this is more than a physical problem here. Now, again, you can look at the intermediate cause. Well, there's probably a dopamine imbalance, or maybe he's a schizophrenic. Or you Don't go there too quickly. That, that may be an intermediate cause of someone who is described this way in Luke 8. But the Bible is diagnosing the ultimate cause. Verse 27, when Jesus had stepped out on land, there he met a man from the city who had demons. Okay, so I know the problem. According to the Scripture, he's got demons. For a long time, he had worn no clothes. Now, you show up at any kind of meeting with no clothes on, that's not normal. Usually, we'd say, well, you need, didn't we have a sermon about this recently? You need clothes to come to church. Uh, No shoes, no shirt, no pants, no service, right? You need clothes because that's how God has created us to be. And if you don't wear clothes and we have this inborn understanding of our shame that we want to cover up, well, this guy's not wearing clothes. And he doesn't live in a house. Now, that's odd. He lives in the tombs. Now, there's some places you want a picnic. It's not in the cemetery. He wants to live there, okay? Let's just call this right here insanity and not the, you know, <laughs> infomercial workout variety of insanity. Isn't that something, an insanity workout? I don't know that either mentally or experientially. Um, where were we? Insanity. Yes, I'm talking about the, the insanity not governed by television pop culture. Insanity. Crazy. This man is crazy. Now, of course, we have in verse 27 the reason for his craziness. He has demons. That's the problem. So he falls down before him with a loud voice, and he says, What do you have to do with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? Now, he's crazy like a fox here now because he knows who Jesus is. I mean, he didn't even have... I mean, <laughs> disciples are struggling with that theological concept. And, and here this guy's got it. I beg you, do not torment me. For he had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man, for at that time it had seized him, kept him under guard, and bound him with chains and shackles, but he would break the bonds. Now, there's a really wacky, crazy, green-eyed, uh, who was that guy? The Hulk, right? Ooh, that's super crazy, but it's physical now expression of his crazy. He would break the bonds driven by the demon into the desert. And this is the one, if you might remember, we'll look at this more next week, but the one who has a name who calls himself Legion, and we'll get into that later. But tonight, let's just look at this. He's crazy. He's insane. And according to this text, the reason for his insanity is not a dopamine imbalance. It's not some kind of receptor transmitter problem in the synapse of his brain. It's not a hardware problem. It may be evidenced on a CAT scan, which they didn't have then, but it, it may, you may be saying, oh, the hot spots of the brain is not firing right. Fine, I can get all that. What's causing the problem? Here it says demon. Mark 9. We looked at this one already, but let's remember it if you don't want to turn there. Well, we should turn there because I don't think we read. No, we did read these verses, but whatever. Here we go. We'll read it again. Mark, Mark, 9, 20, Mark 9, 20. Mark chapter 9, verses 20 and 22, 20 through 22. Just to get some context, I'll start in verse 20. And the boy was brought to Jesus, and when the Spirit saw him, the, immediately it convulsed the boy. So there's the epileptic part of the problem. He fell on the ground. He rolled about, foaming at the mouth. I don't know that we did read that. And Jesus asked his father, uh, the, man, the boy's father, how long has this been happening to him? And he said, from childhood. It is often, now here's what the demon has done. The Spirit has cast him into fire. Now, <laughs> think that through. 
that's not helpful at all in any way for your life to be cast into fire and into water. So you can see this kid being cast into the fire or being dumped into water and, and, and the dad has to go and pull him out. But here's the real reason just to show you, it, I mean, it's obvious, but to destroy him, right? If you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. Put it this way, suicidal tendencies. Here is a kid who not because he says, I want to die, but because there is something driving him that wants to kill him. He is someone who has appeared by others. He has the appearance of by others, his father included, that he is wanting to die. Now, again, the father, I guess, is clued in enough. Maybe it's based on what Jesus is now diagnosing, but this kid is not doing this on his own. Suicidal tendencies. And I guess I would say when he was successful, when no one was around, it would be suicide, insanity and suicide. Or in this case, at least to stick with the text, suicidal tendencies. One more. This is the one we've already looked at, Mark 5, right? Well, there's one thing in here. Did we look at that? I don't remember. Short-term memory is failing tonight. Mark 5. Mark 5. Look at this text real quick. And this should be of interest to us in our culture since... There's quite a revival of this problem. Mark 5.5, 5, just to get the context, this is in the Gerasenes. We've got a man, out of the, uh, Christ comes out of the boat, man meets him, lives among the tombs. No one could bind him. Uh, verse 5, night and day among the tombs and on the mountains, he was always crying out and, next two words, do you know that's a big problem today, right? Cutting himself with stones. Estimated in the United States that two to three million people exhibit some form of self-abusive behavior to injure themselves. Cutting is up there. British study in the British Medical Journal estimates that 13% of uh, British 15 and 16-year-olds, it was just those two age groups that were studied, purposefully do this, right? In the United States, they say that one in every 200 girls, this is an older stat a few years back, that one in every 200 girls between 13 and 19 okay, cut themselves regularly. Okay? Those who cut compromise about 70% of the teen girls who self-injure. So that's a very common way to do that. Now, if you've run into that, and I have obviously in pastoral ministry, I run into that, and our whole staff does, I mean... That's an odd behavior, right? And now you can sit down on a couch and talk about your mother or bedwetting or self-esteem and all that. But, you know, at least here in the Scripture, I have an example of a guy who's doing that kind of thing. And the diagnosis here, at least in this instance, is demonically driven. Okay? Let me add this. I added it before. Not all mental problems are demon-caused. But if you look at the problems of mental illness, if you want to call it that, mental problems, mental anomalies, uh, you've got to say that's right up, the alleys of, uh, right up the alley of what demons are all about. It's just like the physical problems that we deal with in our hardware. The software problems are the same. The bugs, if you will, in the software of, of the human mind, uh, the human spirit, the human soul, are um, the things that demons are all about. It's what they are by definition, it's what they are by nature, and it is what they love to do. But I am not saying that all mental problems are demon-caused. Uh, and when you talk about chemical imbalances and dopamine or whatever you want to talk about in terms of what you see as you put it under a microscope, you know, sometimes we need to ask ourselves, you know, what, what's cause and what's effect? What place does it sit in the chain of cause and effect? But at least that's what I'm reading in the Bible. Using the Bible as a guide to figure this out, I see a lot of physical problems caused by demons. I see mental problems caused by demons. doesn't mean everybody who's cutting has got a demon. Everybody who wants to commit suicide has got a demon. Um, but it certainly is what they're all about. All right? There you go. Let's go on to point three because we're running out of time. Actually, we're doing all right. But as soon as I think that, it'll go long. So I won't, I'm thinking, run out of time. Just got to think that. Is there a C? Okay, well, I didn't put it down, and here's why. Because next week, oh, and you know what? That should be A. That A should be B, I mean. But you, you didn't. That didn't bother you. You said, oh, that's just Mike. Hey, we know. 
He's, he's just, yeah. But C, C did throw you off because you didn't want to miss C. If it's there, you can know that A, A, A is really B. But where's C? Because C is on my outline. Okay, C, because I spit on the stage. C, uh, C is this. Uh, here's what I want to call C. Uh, total or complete, you can choose your favorite, demon uh, the word I want to get to is demonization, but it's total demon overtaking. <laughs> See, that's why I prepare before I speak, because if you try to do it while you're speaking, it's not good. Did I write it down anywhere here? I didn't. Total overcoming of a demon. If a demon wants to oppose and harm someone physically, that's one thing. Uh, mentally, that's another. But if it's complete and total, like some of the examples we've seen, all I'm saying is letter C would complete the thought, which is total domination of a demon by a demon. That'd be a better way to put it. Man, had I prepared, that's what I would have said. <laughs> total domination by a demon, which we're going to talk about completely for the whole time, the whole lecture next week on demonization. So we'll get to that next week. So that's why there's no space there under it to speak of, and we're going to move on. Whew. Number three. Now again, all I got room for up here is demonic work to counterfeit God, but if you want to round it out the way, I mean, your worksheet already does, instances of demonic work to counterfeit God, and I'm talking about His power, His authority, His greatness, but ultimately it's counterfeiting God counterfeiting some kind of godness, some kind of divinity, some kind of divine nature, something transcendent, something beyond the natural, something that should be in charge. Demons are all about that, okay? In four different ways that I will at least pull together logically here for you tonight. Uh, but before we look at the first one, which really doesn't necessarily… Yeah, it goes with the first one. Isaiah 46, I quote this quite often, so you may not want to turn there if you… There's no, there's no ending to that sentence, um, so just skip that. Isaiah, Isaiah 46. It's been a very busy day around the office here at Compass Bible Church. Isaiah 46, verse 8. You can catch up or I'll start reading. Here it comes. Remember this and stand firm. God speaking through the, uh, the pen of Isaiah here. Recall it to mind, you transgressors. Remember the former things of old, for I am God, there is no other. I am God, there is none like me. Declaring the end from the beginning. Think that one through. I tell you what's going to happen at the end, and I told you that at the beginning. I'm declaring the end from the beginning, and from ancient times, things that are not yet done. Saying, my counsel shall stand, I will accomplish all of my purpose, I'm the ultimate authority. I do what I want. I call a bird of prey from the east, a man of counsel from a faraway country. I have spoken. I will bring it to pass. I have purposed it. I will do it. Okay? That is a statement of exclusivity about God being able to know the beginning, or the end rather, from the very beginning, and to work out His plan unabated, unmitigated, unrivaled, unchallenged. No one can hold back His hand. Okay? Now, Demons are involved in trying to show that they're all about that. And we can make the connection, as we're about to here, I'll give you, I'll give you lots of examples on this one, in trying to, to get people to find another avenue for that. Now, the proper avenue is prophecy. He finds a prophet, he works through the prophet, he declares the, the end from the beginning. He talks, about the, he talks about the Babylonian captivity in the Pentateuch. In 1445, 40, 40, 42, 35 B.C., while they're in the wilderness, God is using the prophet Moses to talk about something that's going to happen a thousand years later. He uses the pen of Micah to talk about when Christ is coming, you know, four or five hundred years later. That is what God does. Isaiah. 700 years before Christ comes, here's how it's all going to work out. That's prophetic because God says, I can do it. That's, I'm the ultimate authority. Now, there's a power that demons want to try to display that they're the ones that can do that. Look to us. Look to, look to this avenue, whatever the avenue is, because really it's not about them. It's about finding a different avenue than God and the prophetic word that is inscribed in Scripture. Okay, so some examples of this. Acts 16, let's look at this. You've already, you Sunday school graduates 
have already thought of this text. Acts 16. Acts 16. Paul. Silas. Missionary work. Going to the place of prayer. Okay, they're in Philippi. They were met by a slave girl who had, now underlined, a spirit of divination. Divination. I didn't use that word because I think it's antiquated for a lot of people. And we don't see a sign up at the Irvine spectrum that says, you know, diviner. We see the sign up with the weird lady there that says fortune teller, right? You don't see the neon sign say divination here. You see fortune telling here. But it's the same thing, right, as he explains in the next line. Had a spirit of divination and brought her owners much gain by doing the act. What's that? Fortune telling. What's going to happen in your future? Let me tell you what's going to happen in your future. That according to this text, as it plays out, and we don't need to look at the whole thing, is based on demonic activity. Now, wait a minute. You just quoted Isaiah 46, and you said only God can do that. You're right. Only God can do that. But if you are a spirit entity, and you have influence, and you have the ability to intersect with, with space and time and people's lives, you can certainly reveal something that you're going to do right? And no one can see that you do it. And it can happen. So you have a sense of an artificial prophetic action. But God can do a lot of things to inhibit that if He wants to. But this is a kind of real demonstration of demonic power. Not that the demon can see the future, but the demon can certainly act in the future. It'd be like me saying, right, as though I were some invisible spirit, you know what? I predict what, what the pastors of Compass Bible Church will have for their staff lunch next week. It will be pizza. And then what happens? Next Wednesday, we have pizza. <gasps> now, if I'm saying that and you're thinking, let's look at his phone records. He called Porky's Pizza right there. It showed up. Well, of course, that's no prediction. See, but if I'm a demon... It's impressive. Why? Because you're not seeing me working this thing. You're not watching my influence. And that, that certainly will create followers. People were paying this guy because this girl had a real ability. Now, are the people that say fortune teller by the side of the road or the gal that sits there making 10 bucks or whatever it costs to tell your future at the, at the Irvine? You've seen this lady, right? At the Irvine Spectrum? No? Only me? She only there when I go? Anybody seen the fortune teller? Oh, thank you. Man, I really feel like I'm in a, another country, parallel universe. You've seen her. Keep walking, right? Not that she's real, right? There can be charlatans, I would say. Most of them are, right? But here we have the real thing. The real thing is not the real, real thing, which is God is the only one who can do it, who no one can thwart His purpose. But we do have this working out in some situations. The Bible describes one here where divination or fortune-telling is, is the reality. Now, people divine the future, quote-unquote. By the way, divine, you know what that means, right? Divine, divination comes from the word divine. Divine means it's not human, it's not, it's not here, it's not temporal, it's not physical, it's transcendent. Well, in that case it is, but it's not the ultimate divine, divine with a D, the capital D. This is demonic divine, divining. Now, there are other ways. Turn to this passage, please, Isaiah 47. This is all under letter A. Fortune telling. How is fortune telling done? Many different ways. Many different ways. Here's one, Isaiah 47. Prophetic word about Babylon. Verse 12, stand fast in your enchantments. Are you with me now? And your many sorceries with which you've labored from your youth 
Perhaps you may be able to succeed. Perhaps you will inspire terror. You can see the sarcasm here, right? You are wearied with your many counsels. Let them stand forth and save you. If they can, of course they can. Those who divide the heavens and gaze at the stars, who at the new moons make known what shall come upon you. That's divination. What's the means of divination in this text? Stars, what do we call that? Astrology. Astrology. Call for your astrological reading. Look up on the internet your astrological predictions for the day, right? This, you see now why your grandpa was against all of this? Didn't want you reading all the horoscopes? He's <laughs> just think some people never made the connection. This was bad in the olden days because it's bad. Bad 1950 today, people think it's all just for fun. Now, all I'm saying is when you're looking to the stars to determine the future, the Bible is putting this in the same category as verse 12. Uh, or what was it, verse 12? Uh, but, but, no, no, verse 11. Oh, man, where am I? Yeah, great. Is that there? Verse 12. Enchantments and sorceries in which you've labored. And one of them is dividing up the heavens, making the star maps, figuring out what goes where, and then figuring out what's going to come upon you based on the movements of the planets and the moon. Astrology. You want another verse on that? Maybe because you're dealing with that in somebody's life. Jeremiah 10, 2 is another one. Learn not the ways of the nations. Do not be dismayed at the signs in the heavens because the nations are dismayed by them. Stop trying to figure out the future by looking at the sky. Stop it. What about the Magi? Great question. Preaching on that in two weeks. So come back. <laughs> Let's talk about them. Aren't they astrologers? They're following stars, and it led to Christ. Stay tuned. No time for that. No time. No time. Here's a bizarre one. I think we read this one when we introduced the topic. Ezekiel 21. Ezekiel 21. We introduced the topic of demons, and we looked at this one. Now, this one's packed with methods of divination and fortune-telling. And most of them are really weird to us. Like the one in, in, in uh, Joseph. Remember when Joseph... Was it Joseph? Yeah, Joseph. We didn't want to mess with the chalice because, oh, that's the chalice by which they do the divining. That was a kind of, uh, what do they call it, hydromancy, where they, they use the waters to determine the future. Well, there are a lot of esoteric ones, but here's one. I wasn't going to turn you to all of them, but here, this one has three <laughs> in one verse. Ezekiel 21, 21. Drop down to verse 21. For the king of Babylon stands at the parting of the way at the head of two ways to use divination. Okay? What does he use to figure out? the future. He shakes the arrows, okay? There are technical names for this, but the laying of sticks, right? This kind of weird thing about dropping the sticks and then reading the tea leaves. Uh, he, what's the next one here? Consults the teraphim. The teraphim were like little carved chess pieces representing people, and they used those as they threw them down and kind of read how they fell, uh, the teraphim. Uh, he looks at the liver. What? This was, there was a technical name for this I didn't write down either, but they would take animal entrails, maybe you've heard of this one, and, and they would lay them out and, and they would divine the future from looking at that. Well, that sounds crazy. So does the one down the street where you determine the future by reading the palm, right? If, if someone here took a snapshot of that, sent it back to Jeremiah's day, go, or Ezekiel's day, well, that's the weirdest thing I've ever heard. Reading the palm? To tell the future? Yeah, there's lifelines and love lines, and you'll meet Charlie, and he will be a wonderful husband. I mean, that's weird too. And all I'm saying is these are the means of doing something that there's a legitimate biblical purpose for, that God says, I'm the only one who can do this. Look to me if you want to know the future, and I'm only going to tell you what I'm going to tell you. Deuteronomy 29, 29. I'm going to tell you what I'm going to tell you, and whatever I'm going to tell you, you're going to have to be good with that. I'm the only one who can do that. Now, you want to go get your palm read? Bad idea. You want to go get your, uh, you know, your fortune told by whatever means it is? Bad idea. Don't do it. Well, it's just for fun. I don't think it's real. It may not be real at the Irvine spectrum. If it were real, it would cost more probably. Uh, <laughs> so I don't think it's real either there, but you're messing with, you know. It's like, uh, I got a lot of illustrations you should thank me for not using. Um, 
I won't use that one. But let me just, yeah. Even if it's not real, you don't do it, okay? Hmm. <laughs> Ask my wife. She gets the uncensored illustrations later tonight when I tell her what I was going to say. Oh, I'm glad you didn't say that, honey. All right, Deuteronomy 18. Now, th this one's packed full of things, but it brings us to another category. Some of the things we just talked about are in this verse, in this section of Scripture, but there's other things that open up a second category for us. Demons are behind the fortune-telling and the divination. Not always, but sometimes, and that's something trying to counterfeit the power of God, the work of God, the greatness of God, the abilities of God. Verse 9, when you come to the land which the Lord your God is giving you, you should not learn the abominable practices of those nations. It shall not be found among you anyone who burns his son or daughter as an offering. Okay. Anyone who practices divination or tells fortunes or interprets omens, that's another you know, way of, of divination. Sorcery, talk about that later. A charmer or a, here it comes, medium or a necromancer or one who inquires of the dead. Okay. Let's put that down. Me, let's just call them mediums because that's what they call them today, and it's there translated for us, mediums. As you write that down, I'll read verse 12. Whoever does these things is an abomination to the Lord. And because of these abominations, the Lord your God is driving these people out before you. You shall be blameless before the Lord your God. For these nations for which you're about to dispossess, they listen to fortune tellers and diviners, but as for you, the Lord has not allowed you to do this. Okay? So that's back to the fortune telling and the divining. But here it says mediums or necromancers. Like that weird-looking guy that's always on those talk shows about, you know, oh, you're dead. Oh, your father, what did he die? He died of a heart. Was it heart? Heart was it either heart or it was stroke? Oh, was it was heart. Oh, it was heart. Oh, heart. Yes. And you know what he's saying? Oh, you know, he just wants you to know it's okay. And was there a cat involved? A cat? Maybe a dog. A dog? No. It was an. It was a cat. Well, a dog. It was a dog. Yes, it was a dog. Dog. And your dog's name is Fluffy. No, no. Spot. No. Charmer. No. Oh. Yeah, that was it. Okay. And you know, he says it's okay because when your dog died the dog's there with him so everything's cool you've seen this guy and many like him but did i do a good impersonation here <laughs> that is a medium okay and most mediums are charlatans like the witch at endor do you remember her how do i know she was a charlatan because she, when she did her little thing and took it was on the take when saul came and said oh i gotta talk to samuel and samuel shows up she freaked out Ma! Now I'm thinking, if this is your job, <laughs> you shouldn't be freaked out right now. She was freaked out because it worked, right? When it works, and even when you don't know that it will, or even if you're confident, it doesn't. Because I'm thinking all the gals in the, in the gallery of the talk show, they all think it's real, except for a few, you know, folded arms in the corners. Most of them, oh, amazing, Okay. That is an abomination to the Lord. To try to talk to the ones beyond the physical. Now, here's what I'm saying. These are counterfeits. Why? Because there is a means of divination. It's called prophecy. There is a means of talking to those in another realm. It's called prayer, right? And we're told not to pray to others. We're to pray to one. We can talk to someone who's not in this realm. You can talk to a spirit. He's called the Holy Spirit. Do you see what I'm saying? That's how God wants you to do it every day. Not your dead relatives. He wants to talk to him. And your dead relatives, if they were Christians, are with him. So talk to him. Don't talk to them. He doesn't want you looking anywhere else. That's what the nations were doing. And he said, it's an abomination to me. I haven't allowed you to do this. Acts 8. Acts chapter 8. Let's look at this one. Mmm, so much here. I'm giving you a big chunk to write down. We, we won't read all that, but... Acts 8, verse 9. There was a man named Simon. Previously practiced magic. There's the Greek word transliterated into English, magic. It picked up in English, and we have that word, magic. Which, by the way, we get the word from that, and it's there in, in, in uh, Matthew 2, which we're going to preach on in two weeks, Lord willing. That's the plan. 
And they get their name from this word magic, and they're called the Magi, which in the ESV, they don't use that word. They say wise men, but if it'll have a star and a footnote, and it'll say literally in the, in the language, in the Bible, in the Greek, it'll say Magi, Magi, magic. Which, what about them then? Because you're about to say this is bad, which, by the way, is, is the point if you want to jot it down, five letters, magic. Okay. Well, it is bad. What about the Magi? Great. I'm glad you're asking those questions. It's a perfect setup for you to come in two weeks. Is it two weeks? Three weeks. It's three weeks, isn't it? Because we, this weekend, we're finishing our series on gray areas, which is not a seasonal message, uh, but we're going to preach it anyway. And then we have the, the uh, Christmas musical, and then, Lord willing, we have a sermon on, on the Magi. Back to our story. Man, Simon, previously practiced magic in the city, was amazed. He amazed the people of Samaria. Why? Because he did this stuff. What was it? And we're going to explain it. Saying that he himself was somebody great. They all paid attention to him from the least to the greatest, saying, this man is the power of God that is called great. Not the God of the Bible, not Yahweh, not the God of heaven, not the God of the Bible, a different God called great. And they paid attention to him because for a long time he amazed them with his magic. When they believed Philip, as he preached the good news about the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus, they were baptized, both men and women. And even Simon himself believed. And after being baptized, he continued with Philip, seeing signs and great miracles he performed, and he was amazed. Okay? Now, when the apostles of Jerusalem heard Samaria had received the word of God, they sent Peter to him, come down and pray that he might receive the Holy Spirit, for he was, they had not fallen on him yet. Transitional period, different sermon later. But he had only been baptized in the name of Jesus. When they laid their hands on them, they received the Holy Spirit. Now, when Simon saw that the Spirit was given through the laying on of hands, he offered them money, saying, Give me this power also, so that anyone who I lay my hands on may receive the Holy Spirit. Peter said, May your silver perish with you, because you thought you could obtain the gift of God with money. You neither have a part in this lot, nor for this, in this, you, for you neither have part. Hmm. Let's start over. You have neither part nor lot in this matter, for your heart is not right before God. Repent of this wickedness of yours and pray to the Lord that if possible, the intent of your heart may be forgiven you. For I see you're in the gall of business. On he goes. Uh, magic. Simon saw something akin to what was happening with the apostles, which was the le legitimate ability of the apostles, as it says in uh, 2 Corinthians 12, 12, to do miraculous signs and wonders. He wanted that. That was an upgrade from what he was doing, but it was in the same vein and spectrum of what he was doing, and it's called in the Bible magic. shouldn't be new to us. In your, in your notes, a lot of verses to write down. We won't turn to any of them, but uh, uh, Exodus 7, 22. Remember that? The magicians of Egypt, same word, different. I mean, it's Hebrew, of course did the same by their secret arts, so Pharaoh's heart remained hardened. Why? Because they were doing miracles, Aaron and, Matt and Moses, before Pharaoh, but then the magicians came and did the same things. That's a supernatural kind of act. Um, Acts 13. I uh, won't turn you there, but Acts 13, 4 through 12. Sergius Paulus false prophet named Bar-Jesus, if those names are familiar from studying it, Elemis the, the magician, um, they had an encounter there with them. Uh, chapter 19 of Acts, Acts 19, 18, and 19. Ch Acts chapter 19, verses 18 and 19. They were confessing their sins and divulging their practices, uh, and, and a number of those who practiced the magic arts brought their books together and burned them in the sight of all. And they counted the value of them. It was more than 50,000 pieces of silver, which is a lot of days' work there. So they were involved in trying to tap into this supernatural realm. Uh, yeah. You mean demons can do these kinds of things? The next recorded, or I should say prophesied, I've said this many times, but the next prophesied coming of, of actual supernatural miracles is coming with the man of lawlessness. 2 Thess 2.9, he will do signs and wonders by the power of Satan. Okay? So, of course, they can do this. They, you know, when allowed, they can do this. Uh, Rev 13, 11 through 15, to make your notes complete. The Antichrist comes, he performs signs, even makes fire come down from heaven in front of all the people. All right. Could give you more, but we're out of running out of time. As I said, we would. 
Last one, Rev 9. Oh, this one is interesting. Keep your thinking caps on, though, because you don't want to forget this because you'll remember it from Sunday school or something. You'll, you've heard this before, but let's pull this together in our brains. Four different passages that use this Greek word in the New Testament. Different, different word in the Old Testament. don't have time for that, but Rev 9, 20, and 21. And the rest of mankind who were not killed by the plagues, did not repent of the work of their hands, nor give up worshiping demons and idols of gold and silver and bronze and of wood and, 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 and stone and wood, which cannot see or hear or walk, nor did they repent of their murders, that's bad, or their sorceries. Do you see that word, sorceries? Or their sexual immoralities or their thefts. That's the word, now you're going to remember this when I say it, pharmakia. Remember that? Pharmakia. Sorceries was not just someone divining, and it wasn't just a medium. It wasn't someone just telling your future, and it wasn't just someone, you know, contacting your dead grandfather. The sorcerer, that particular word was used because of what he did when you came to his little shop or his home. He would put together potions. Literally, this is translated in classical Greek, the poisoner. He would have concoctions, and he would have things that you took he would have potions and drugs, there's the word, for you to take so that you could connect with the spirit realm, right? Which was anything that could take you from where you're at to something else, as we call it today, the psychotropic drugs. Psycha, right? Suke, spirit or, or soul. Tropic is the word to turn, to turn you to the spirit world. That's the concept of the psychedelic, psychotropic drugs, the mind-altering, or I guess what they call now the psycho, uh, psych, what do they call that set of drugs? Um, Psycho-something drugs. Uh, you know, anyway, the, the point is they're drugs that connect me here. Now, are there some kinds of drugs that they use to treat certain things? Yeah, but when drugs are utilized to turn me, not to fix a, a malady, some kind of p bad in my life, but to, you know, as we do in our culture, recreate we. <laughs> Not a druggie, never had drugs. Uh, a lot of ibuprofen, but no drugs. Uh, to go and, and not to fix a headache or a migraine, but to, to connect, to, to, to get out of myself, to, to, you know, the hallucinogenic drugs, right, recreational drugs. And you can see where alcohol can get you there, too. That's why in the Bible, drunkenness is compared, or I should say contrasted to, and polarized against what? Following the Spirit. i got to think. i got to work. Careful how you walk, the text says in that same passage. i got to think. i got to consider. i got to discern what's pleasing to the Lord to follow the Spirit. i got to be all here. And these things like drunkenness take me somewhere else. They dull me. They, they move me away from that. i got enough things in life trying to dull me. I don't need things that take me that direction. Drugs. Uh, other references to this, Rev 21, 8, same word, but as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, the murderers, the sexually immoral, the sorcerers, the pharmakia people, the idolaters and liars, their portion be with the lake that burns with fire. 22.15, Rev 22.15, outside of the dogs, the sorcerers, the sexually immoral, the murderers, the idolaters, the sorcerers, the pharmakia. And then the one in the list where in verse 21 of Galatians 5, it says drunkenness. In verse 20, it says sorcery, idolatry and pharmakia, sorcery. Now, if you're thinking it's a guy in a back shop doing some kind of weird incantation in the middle of these things, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, dissensions, drunkenness, do you see what I'm saying? The word here is about people cutting loose with some kind of chemical, some kind of something that takes me away, takes me into some other, you know, higher mental plane or some kind of hallucination. And therein are the four uses of the word pharmakia in the New Testament. Now, you said there were parallels. Yeah, fortune-telling is prophecy. If it's the right stuff, I'm looking to God to tell me the future, and I get, I get through the prophets what He told me. Uh, prayer... I'm connecting with the ultimate spirit of the universe, the Holy Spirit. Magic, well, we saw in that passage the GT1s of the apostles and prophets, the God thing ones, the breaking of natural law. That's what happened in the Bible in three rashes. 
Uh, and then drugs, what's the drug thing? What do they want? Even psychotropic means to get my mind out of here and move it over here. Well, doesn't the Bible say that we as Christians, what are we supposed to be? Not be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the... That's the that's, there's the righteous parallel. I don't want to think the way I think, but drugs aren't the answer, right? That's the demon pathway to take me somewhere else. God's pathway is for me to get in the Word of God, to know the Word of God, to let the Word of Christ richly dwell in me, to change the way I think, to put on the new man, right? To be the person I am in Christ and to think differently. All of these have legitimate parallels. I shouldn't say parallels, but contrasts, uh, antithetical connections or polar, you know, corresponding uh, corollaries in, in righteous things. All right. Next week, we'll talk about daemonizomai. We'll talk about demon-caused passivity, a.k.a. also known as demon possession. Let me pray for you, and I'll let you go. God, thanks for our time. Thanks for this group. Please, um, not that you need to, not that you have to. We should all be a part of the church and come to church because we're supposed to, but I would ask that you would be kind in repaying those that have come here in a busy week, a busy time of year, and let the information, the edification through the teaching of your word be such compensation for their effort to be here tonight that they feel so enriched and so uh, uh, heightened in terms of their understanding of you and your word. May it do exactly what, what, what we talked about there in that very last sub point, that we want our minds renewed. We want to think differently. We want to think more biblically, more like you. We want to be transformed into the likeness of Christ. So help us, God, as we study your word May this night and this study and this lecture help to do that for our lives in Jesus' name. Amen.